Michael Chertoff, in your new book, Homeland Security, Assessing the First Five Years, you write about the September 10 mindset, and this is what you write. The voice of complacency sounds something like this. Here we are eight years after 9-11, and because there have been no attacks on our soil, 9-11 must have been some freakish aberration that is unlikely to repeat itself. Al-Qaeda's strength has been hyped by the government, which is exaggerating the threat. There are things to worry about. There are other things to worry about. This problem has gotten boring, and we should move to something else and focus on other elements of the public agenda. Well, I think that is a concern. And I, to be honest, I think it was a predictable concern, uh, even in the days after September 11th. Um, I remember President Bush warning this was going to be a long-term process. I think a lot of other people said, uh, you know, we, we were terribly afraid of another attack, but if we were successful in preventing attacks, the irony is it would likely wind up uh, telling, indicating to some people they ought to lower their guard. And so for me what's important is not to get people uh, to the level of fear or anxiety that we had right after September 11th, but it is also to make sure we don't go back and repeat the mistakes that led to September 11th, which is not uh, being, uh, not persevering in terms of uh, building our defenses in terms of making sure we're taking on the enemy and not, uh, not adapting ourselves to what is an evolving strategy that we see the terrorists engaging in. And you don't write about this in the book, but have you seen any signs by the Obama administration that, in your view, they're returning to that? Mindset? No, I, I mean, the Obama administration at, at this point seems to be continuing largely along the course that we set over the last eight years. Certainly in my department, I think uh, Secretary Napolitano has been very good a very good leader, and she has continued to press forward on the major uh, homeland security items, which I think are important. Do you talk to her regularly at all? Uh, not regularly, but I have talked to her, and you know, we've known each other for 15 years, and um, I was pleased that she was nominated and confirmed, and I think she's doing a good job. In your book, you write, even our full current array of tools is not sufficient to deal with an ever-evolving threat environment. Well, let me give you an example. Uh, prior to 9-11, the thing people worried about the most were truck bombs. And if you look back historically uh, to the embassy bombings and even going further back to bombings in Lebanon, that was a reasonable concern. But of course, <clears throat> on September 11th, we saw airplanes become the weapon of choice. And now we've seen, of course, that uh, the airport and the airlines uh, are a target. We saw that most recently in August 2006. Still more recently, in 2008, there was an attack in Mumbai, and for the first time we saw a different kind of threat, a rolling attack with guns where the terrorists move from place to place. So the terrorists continue to refine what they do, and what's important is that we continue to think ahead about what has not only happened before, but what might come next. Well, when you talk about what <coughs> some of the things that need <coughs> to be done are, the first thing you stress is securing the border. Why? Because, at least from the standpoint of homeland security, if you can't stop the enemy overseas, you want to stop them coming in. And you do that in two ways. You look at the ports of entry. You look to make sure that when people come through the airport or the seaport, they have documents that you can check, that you have information about them so you can judge whether they should be admitted or not. And, of course, the second half of the strategy is between the borders. And there we built over 600 miles of fence. Uh, we began to lay down some very sophisticated technology and again, both of these are, in both of these areas, we made very substantial progress, but the job is not done, and it's got to continue, and that's what I think is, is the current agenda. Our guest is Michael Chertoff, served from 2005 <coughs> to 2009 as uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, and uh, the numbers are up on the screen. We want to hear from you, get your questions for Secretary Chertoff, but also we're going to hear from some law students up at Drexel University in Philadelphia. They attend the Earl Mack School of Law up there. The C-SPAN Civics Bus is parked outside the law school. And we're going to talk to some of the students, too, who have questions for Secretary Chertoff. Matthew Lynch is our first student up. Matthew, please go ahead with your question for Secretary Chertoff. Hello. Um, given recent disclosures about the extent to which the uh, federal government has relied on uh, private security contractors such as Blackwater for jobs that were traditionally the role of the federal government, whether they be um, interrogations or the potential assassinations under the CIA plan. Um, do you think under current Supreme Court doctrine of either entanglement or entwinement that the contractors could be considered 
effectively state actor. Yeah, and uh, if Matthew, not, I'm sorry, we lost your audio. You were talking about the contractors. Could they be effectively considered what? State, state I think, actors. I think state actors. <clears throat> okay, thank you. You know, I think the uh, obviously the issue of contractors has <clears throat> has a lot of different dimensions. Uh, when contractors act at the direction of the government, they often are regarded as state actors, and they get the same protections, and they get held to the same standards. A larger question I think people raise is, what is the appropriate role for contractors? Clearly, there are a number of areas in which contractors make a lot of sense, uh, logistics, supply, uh, even security, where they can supplement uh, a military that is already stretched pretty thin. What we do try to avoid doing is having the contractors actually becoming the decision makers for the government. Uh, in the end, the government has to reserve the ultimate decision. The contractors, however, can help the government in uh, formulating that decision and in carrying it out. Next, first call up for uh, Michael Chertoff, <coughs> St. Petersburg, Florida, William, Independent Line. Hi. Hello, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, uh, you mentioned the September 10th, 2001 mindset. Uh, that made me nervous, so I, I think it should be September 9th. I was wondering if the missing $2, two, $2 trillion plus that uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld reported on September 10th, 2001, you know, where that, where those trillions went. Did they, did you all ever find it? I have to say, I must have, I must have missed that news report about the missing uh, trillions. Um, I do know that in the run-up to September 11th, uh, the 9-11 Commission looked back at uh, what had been done and what hadn't been done, and I think they found the key uh, problem was collecting information and fusing information so that we could get the best possible picture of the threat we faced. You know, in the Cold War, uh, we worried about uh, bombers and missiles attacking the United States, and that's why we had radar. In the war involving terrorists, uh, we don't have radar that's going to detect uh, bombs and, and missiles that, that are going to uh, prevent attacks. What we have is intelligence, and the ability to gather and analyze and uh, integrate all that intelligence is the principal way in which we protect ourselves. Your predecessor, Tom Ridge, wrote in his book, but then denied it, uh, saying that he was, it was the color-coded system, he raised it, as, and it was a political issue why he raised it. I want to get your comments. On well, that. first, I, I actually think, I don't think Tom went that far. I think what Tom said is he wondered at one or two points whether there was someone making a political calculation. I, I can tell you unequivocally, during my four years, uh, there was never the whiff or hint of any political calculation uh, or any White House uh, pressure with respect to the color code. We raised it twice. We raised it uh, right after the July 2005 London bombing for about a month, and we did that only with respect to mass transit. And then we did it after the August 2006 uh, airline plot uh, for obvious reasons, and that has remained at an elevated level because we have continued to see efforts uh, to attack our airline system. There's a reason we raise it, and it's because there are a series of operational steps that are taken either at the airports or the subway stations that are tied to the level of the alert. And so if we want to have a higher degree of security in a particular place, we need to raise the alert level. I do think, you know, the, the current secretary has taken a second look at this. I read in the paper there's a, a recommendation to reduce the number of levels. I've actually advocated that myself, I think. It's unlikely we're going to be getting down to the, the most benign levels in the foreseeable future. But I think the basic system is sound, and I think it, it, it's, it has not been changed much over the last few years, uh, and that reflects the fact that it's become a more stable and accepted process. As a private citizen now, what do you think of your TSA? Well, I've had the opportunity to go through TSA quite frequently. I'm really impressed by the quality of, of the screeners. Uh, they're professional. I think I've had an opportunity to talk to them face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, they enjoy the challenge, but they also understand the importance of the job. And most important, we've reconfigured the way the system works to try to maximize the ability to move efficiently and not compromise on the level of security. The next big step here is going to be uh, a technological jump. Uh, I think even last year, I could see evidence that we were getting close to some positive developments. The better the technology, the more efficient it will continue to be.